Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Roxanne Bland, author of the new novel, Mareva of Astereth. Roxanne, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Jeff. Glad to be here. Well, if someone hasn't heard about your new novel yet, how would you describe the Mareva of Astereth? Well, I would say that it's the journey of a young, bigoted woman into homeless. I think that's basically what it is. And do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to write this novel? Yes. It was a, an attempt to explain one of the perhaps origins of bigotry. In this case, the young woman in question is very sheltered. Cloistered is really the right word. And her experience of the world is quite limited. And what she has seen so far, um, there is a race of people that she feels are beneath her. And how wrong she is as she finds out. And so what was your writing journey, your original writing journey that led you to writing and publishing your first novel? To be honest, I was bored with the market. The books were all seeming to read alike. Different names, different places, and sometimes different events. But they were so predictable. And I decided I wanted to shake things up a bit for myself. So my first book um, about other things, uh, oppression and revolution, is about a alpha werewolf who falls for a war-weary we- alien. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Go ahead. Laugh. Um, a lot of people do. But it's funny when I read the reviews from the readers. The word I stumble across most often is original. I've never read anything like this before. <laughs> and of course, my favorite is weird. But hey, I'm, I'm weird. <laughs> I consider that a compliment. That's great. So are you self-publishing your novels? Yes. Yes, I am. Because um, my books are not mainstream. I do not write to the market. And publishers, they're a business. And it's understandable. They're a business. They need to make money. So they're not necessarily interested in anything too original. They want what sells. And that's fine. And that's fine. So one of the things that, um, you know, companies like, you know, Amazon, I guess Amazon was probably first, wasn't it? But they gave me the opportunity to publish my books myself. And um, yes, I have to do everything, but that's okay. I'm, I'm, I'm publishing words, stories that probably would never have seen the marketplace if I had. And And so so how how is is the the self-publishing process process working for you? It works fine. It works fine. I mean, this is not to say there aren't glitches along the way, Mm -hmm. but, you know, technology has just made it so much easier um, to do these things. And I think probably the greatest innovation was print on demand. Because otherwise, I would have to do, I think the smallest print run I've ever come across was 100 books. The standard is 5,000. So basically, I would have a lot of books sure. in my garage. <laughs> so print on demand has, has really made a difference um, for authors, self-published authors like me. I prefer the term indie. It sounds a little edgier. Sure. Um, but and of course the other thing is ebooks. Um, ebooks have dispensed with the need for print, and it is also much cheaper 
to, you know, produce an ebook than it is a print book. And your and because it's electronic, your distribution instantly can be worldwide. So that's a big plus, you know. It's it's I so I guess the bottom line is it's the technological changes over the past twenty odd years that has allowed the the rise of indie publishing to the point where it's actually challenging the traditional houses. Sure. sure. Do you do you find that you do you feel that you are finding your audience and your readership uh, via indie publishing? Yes, I am, and I will tell you it's a struggle. It's a struggle because, as I mentioned, my books are not written to market, so I've had to spend a lot of time to find my tribe, as it were. And I'm finding them. I mean, I, I, I have, um, you know, my newsletter is growing. These are people who chose my book from a roster of others and signed up for my newsletter. So yeah, it's, it's, it's because my books can't be categorized. I can't say that, oh, I'm going to pitch this to the romance readers. Oh, I'm going to pitch this to the paranormals. Oh, I'm going to pitch this to science fiction because it's all of them. And there are a lot of readers don't want that challenge of why do you have my, your fantasy in my science fiction? <laughs> That's not something they're interested in. They'll be totally turned off um, by having a fantasy with science fiction in it. And in fact, when I first, my first book, when I started shopping it around, I was told by established authors as well as agents, big time agents, that science fiction and fantasy cannot, will not mix. And I had to say, well, I've already done it. <laughs> and so I, you know, that's when I went out to do indie publishing. I, you know, I was like, well, I know my book, I know my book is good. I know my book is very good. And I know there are people out there who would enjoy it. So I've had to find them. And that has been difficult. Yes, that has been a struggle. So when you're working on a new novel, what is your writing process? Do you outline extensively or do you write more organically? How does that work for you? My writing is completely organic. Um, I've tried the outline route and it just didn't work for me. <laughs> I start with an idea, a thing, and then I imagine a story around it. And when I have my characters, my main character or more, because sometimes my book has, has more than main, one main character, I start writing and I start seeing what trouble they get into. My current work in progress is tackling the evils, or maybe not, of colonialism. So that this is this is going to be fun. It in, it involves research um, into the Roman Empire and their colonization efforts. Um, I have. Um, Two, two main sources, um, a, a historian, um, a British historian, and a, another British author who happens to be an archaeologist. <laughs> and his specialty in Roman history. <laughs> so w we've been having a lot of great talks. That's great. Well, do you ever sit down at your computer and have problems getting started writing for the day? And if so, what do you do when that happens for you? You know, I never have a problem with that. <laughs> <laughs> I know people, people authors say, you know, I, there are days when I sit at the computer and I can't think of a thing. I never have a problem with that. <laughs> I don't know why. Maybe it's just my stories are just trying so hard to get out. Now, this does not mean I don't do a lot of rewrite, but, and I do that while I'm editing and while I'm writing, I know that's a no, no, I'm a bad girl. 
but that's just the way I work. And um, so I, I don't stare at a blank page. <laughs> so when people say that, you know, I, you know, I'm having trouble like that. I just keep quiet. Sure. sure. <laughs> so what <laughs> writing advice would you offer for those who are Artists, listening, who are writing right. their own stories and novels? Listen to your inner voice. For those who are actually writing, listen to your inner voice. Your inner, your, you know what you want to write. You may not be able to express it that well, and that's what editors are for. But you know what you, you want to write and go ahead and write it. I, I think the, one of the worst things an author can do, especially a new author, is try to follow all of the rules that get thrown at them. And personally, I like um, mom's rule, which is <laughs> there are three rules to writing and nobody knows what they are. So go ahead and write whatever you want. And it, it'll be fine. It'll be fine. Because you're expressing, you're expressing your truth, not anybody else's. And that's what makes your work so unique. That's good advice. So what fiction or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Well, the most recent book was called A Salmon Weird Um A Salmon Weird Crime Comedy Caper. Yeah, it's a big one. Great book. It is about the protagonist is a retired British detective who lives in a village full of ghosts. He's the only living person in this village. And the ghosts aren't, you know, the kind of, you know, the faceless woman, you know, dressed in white, you know, floating up the stairs. They interact. And they're from all periods of history. We have a Celtic warrior queen. We have a Roman, a Roman Navy captain. We have, um, people from the 17th century we have the Tudor period they're all mixed together and it's fascinating it's it's a oh don't forget the lusty pirates and it's just absolutely fascinating um it's by an author named M.G. Mason his books are available on Amazon and they're, they're just wonderful so that's my last um fiction reading my last nonfiction, oh gosh, I've got a TBR pile that's a mile high. <laughs> um, but I just bought a book by another British author. He's a psychiatrist. And it's about, I don't, the title escapes me at the moment, but mm -hmm. it, it's about his experiences, like 40 or 50 years, dealing with people who've had near-death experiences. And what they saw. For sunny days of celebration, this week at Meyer, you'll find great prices across the store on all your favorite things. Right now, 80% lean ground beef family packs are just $1.99 per pound. Locally grown large whole seedless watermelon are $2.49 each with m -perks. And Kingsford Twin Pack Original Charcoal are $16.89. Plus, now through September 4th, save $10 on your order of $100 or more on Meyer pickup and delivery orders. See m -perks for details. Exclusions apply. See all the deals in the Meyer app you know, how it changed their lives and things like that. So I'm really anxious to get to that one. That sounds good. That sounds interesting. I've always been interested in those near-death experiences. Yeah. Yeah. So are you working on a new novel now? Yes. Yes. It's, I mentioned it. It was the, uh, it doesn't have a title yet. I was thinking song for a planet, but not sure. It's, um, this is the one that I mentioned before that deals with colonialism. Right, right. And it's got four main characters, one of which is a werewolf, a vampire, a mage, and of course, the alien. And they're roaming the galaxy in her battleship. And they come across a distress call. And now they're going to investigate it and figure it out. And they're going to get into lots and lots of trouble. One thing I'll say about my books is they... Well, first of all, they're character-driven, 
as opposed to plot driven, obviously. But they also get more into the emotion of the characters. It's not just about their adventure. And all of my books are like that. They're the care, you know, one reviewer, this was a critical review. He said that there was a depth of emotion to this science fiction that is not often found in other novels. And that just comes from the inside. I mean, that just comes from, you know, what I'm feeling, what I see these characters doing. You know, I see them doing X. How are they feeling about it? And that's, that's where my stories also get a little different um, when you're dealing with um, the emotions of people above, you know, anger, joy, things like that. Sure, sure. Well, well, if, if someone, someone listening, listening was, interested was interested in, in indie, indie publishing, publishing, is there any specific advice that you would offer for someone considering that path? Yes. I would say there are all kinds of organizations you can join who cater to indie publishing. For example, there's this one group, it's, it's UK-based, but I find them to be very helpful. It's called the Alliance of Independent Authors. And their archives, their resources are just incredible. Um, Basically, everything you need to know about indie publishing. And one thing about indie, indie publishing, too, is that, and I guess it's all publishing. You know, by and large, it's all the same. There may be different nuances. Sure. But it's all the same. I mean, it's, it's the same process. You know, Amazon in the UK may work a little differently than Amazon US, but it's basically the same process. And there are other um, indie groups out there. Um, uh, indie Reader, they're one. They, um, they, they completely, I mean, they're all indie writers. They're not interested in anybody else. But if you just look up on the web, you know, indie authors, you'll find all kinds of stuff out there. Sure. Well, where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you and your novels? Well, they can go to my website, um, www.roxanbland.rocks, or they can go to my Amazon page, um, and of course, they can also buy a book while they're there, but they can go to my Amazon page, you know, uh, find out what I'm, you know, doing with my, I think they call it Author Central or something like that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, those are probably the two best places, I'd say. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Roxanne Bland, author of the new novel, The Mareva of Astereth. The novel is on sale now, so go buy a copy. And Roxanne, thanks for doing this interview. Um, thank you, Jeff. Can I just say one more thing to authors? You can. Yep. Especially for new authors. When anybody reads, you know, well, first of all, whatever you write, somebody's not going to like it or be offended by it for whatever reason. What you have to remember is that readers comprehend a story through the lens of their own knowledge and experience. And that knowledge and experience may be all that lets them see the message of your book. So when you get a bad review like that or whatever, I mean, you know, other than the ones that, you you know, you suck. But when you get a negative review, don't sweat it. It's okay. That's it. That's great. Thanks a lot, Roxanne. Well, thank you, Jeff, for having me. I've enjoyed myself. Great. Hello. My name is Roxanne Bland, and I'm reading from my newest release, The Moreva of Asterisk, available everywhere except Google Play. Chapter 1 I could have you executed for this, Moreva Tehi, Asterisk said. My Devi grandmother, the goddess of love, scowled at me from her golden throne in the massive great hall of her equally massive temple. Today, her long white hair had been woven into slender braids entwined with multicolored strands of tiny jewels. 
They sparkled in the candescent light radiating from the ceiling and the bulbous wall-height fixtures. Her golden eyes burned with fury. Sitting on my heels, I bowed my head, not wanting to see her anger. I stared at the black and gold polished floor, trying to ignore the trickle of sweat snaking down my spine. My unbound hair, white like hers, hung over my face. Yes, most holy one, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. You blaspheme by not celebrating Ora Namtar, the holiest rite of the gods. You are well aware that this was not Ora Sin praising my role in creating Paris, but extolling all the deeds of the great pantheon and bringing this planet to life. Ora Namtar celebrates our creation of the Hakoi, and the worthiest, handpicked by me and my brothers and sisters, celebrate it with us. Marduk asked me of your whereabouts. Your absence sorely disappointed him. I shuddered in fear and loathing. Marduk, lord of the skies, was Asterisk's twin brother and my granduncle. I'd been scared of him since childhood and always made sure I was never alone with him. I hated the way he'd stare at me when no one was looking, licking his lips as if I were a juicy piece of meat just waiting to be devoured. I had been too young to participate in the last Oranamtar and knew he would have been only too eager to get his hands on me during this one. Morevatehi, Asterisk's hard tone, brought me back to the moment. You are my acolyte. Your participation was not an option. By your absence, you did not share your body with us, your brother and sister Morevs, and our worthy Hakoi. You sully the sacredness of Ora Namtar. What do you have to say for yourself? I can only offer my most abject apologies, most holy one. Your apologies are not accepted. Yes, most holy. Where were you? I was in the laboratory, working on a cure for red fever. Our four-year cycle will end this summer, and thousands of Hakoi in the gods' cities and towns could die, so I know that, my grandmother snapped. But why did you miss Ora Namtar? Did you not hear the bells? Yes, most holy one. I heard them. I was about to lay aside my work when I noticed an anomaly in one of my parion solutions, so I decided to take a minute to investigate. What I found, I just lost track of time. You lost track of time, she repeated, sounding incredulous. Do you expect me to believe that? Yes, most holy one, it is the truth. My head and hearts began throbbing, my grandmother probing me for signs I had lied. But she wouldn't find any. Lying to her was pointless, and her punishment for lying was harsh. Swaying under the onslaught, I endured the pain without making a sound. After what seemed like forever, the throbbing ease, leaving me sick and dizzy. Very well. I accept what you say is true. I still do not accept your apology. Yes, most holy one, I said, panting a little. A minute passed in uncomfortable silence. Uncomfortable for me, anyway. Another minute passed. And another. It, is she finished with me? I prayed to be dismissed, but I wasn't. What do you have against my Hakoi, Moreva? I frown. I don't understand, most holy one. I have watched you. You give them no respect. You heal them because you must, but you treat them like animals. Why is that? The trickle of sweat reached the small of my back and pooled there. But my work, your work, is a game between you and the red fever. It has nothing to do with my Hakoi. I didn't reply. It was true. Discovering the cure was a challenge I'd taken on because no one since the dawn of Paris had been able to find one. It was a war, me assaulting the virus's defenses and the virus fending off my attacks. Our war was my obsession and one I meant to win. And I didn't care about the Hakoi. I despised them. They were docile enough. The Devi's spawning and breeding program saw to that. But they were slow-witted, not unlike the Pirsu the temple raised for meat and hide. They stank of Makira, the pungent cabbage that was their dietary staple. 
From what I'd seen traveling through Chara to Asterisk and to the e- temples of the other gods, all of the Hokoi were stupid and smelly, and I wanted nothing to do with them. But I wouldn't, couldn't admit she was right. I racked my brain trying to think of something that wasn't an outright lie. Then it came to me. Most holy one, I treat your Hokoi the way I do because it is a hierarchy of being as a Debbie created it. You taught us the great pantheon of twelve is supreme. The minor Devi are beneath you, and the Merev are beneath the minor gods, and your Hakoi are beneath the Merev. Beneath the Hakoi are the plants and animals of Paris. But sometimes your Hakoi forget their place and must be reminded. The great hall was silent. I held my breath, praying she wouldn't probe me again. A pretty explanation, Moreva Tehi. But my Hakoi know their place. It is you who do not yours. You are the only Merev and Kara to have more Debbie blood in your veins than Hakoi, but that does not change your station, nor can you rise above it. Your privileges to freely move about Uruk without temple authorization, to participate in the gods' festivals and games, to travel most anywhere in Kara, are the same as any of your brothers and sisters. And it is the Merev who attend my Hakoi. As a healer, you are not too good to minister to their needs, and you are surely not too good to celebrate Ora Namtar with them. I swallowed. Yes, most holy one. Look at me. I raised my head. My grandmother's expression was fierce. And that is why you let the time get away from you, as you say. You, Moreva Tehi, my alkaline of love, are a bigot. I might understand if you were still a child, but you are not. You have done nothing to better yourself since then. Your bigotry is the reason you did not celebrate Ora Namtar. You did not want to share your body with our Hakoi. She glared as if daring me to contradict her. For sunny days of celebration, this week at Meyer, you'll find great prices across the store on all your favorite things. Right now, 80% lean ground beef family packs are just $1.99 per pound. Locally grown large whole seedless watermelon are $2.49 each with m And Kingsford Twin Pack Original Charcoal are $16.89. Plus, now through September 4th, save $10 on your order of $100 or more on Meyer pickup and delivery orders. See m for details. Exclusions apply. See all the deals in the Meyer app. 